Hello YouTube, I am Dr. Robiul. I work as a lecturer of pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is megaloblastic anemia. In this video, first we will try to define megaloblastic anemia and megaloblast. Then we will try to discuss the types of megaloblastic anemia and then since vitamin B12 and folate deficiency are the most common cause of megaloblastic anemia, so then we will discuss vitamin B12 and folate metabolism. We will also try to discuss the clinical features of megaloblastic anemia. We will also discuss briefly about a special subtype of megaloblastic anemia known as pernicious anemia and then we will discuss the common lab diagnosis, special test and treatment. Okay, so let's begin. First question, what is megaloblastic anemia? So as written in your textbook, you will see megaloblastic anemia is a type of anemia which is characterized by distinctive cytological and functional abnormalities in the blood cells and bone marrow cells due to impaired DNA synthesis. So I am repeating the definition again. Megaloblastic anemia is a anemia that is characterized by distinctive type of cytological and functional abnormality in the cells of the peripheral blood and bone marrow due to impaired DNA synthesis. Okay, now we will explain this definition after a while, but the second important thing you need to know about megaloblastic anemia is what is megaloblast. So we are pausing the definition there and we, are, we will now take a quick look at the term megaloblast. Okay, so what is a megaloblast? Always remember megaloblast is an unusually large erythroblast that is commonly associated with vitamin B12 and folate deficiency. Recall that erythroblasts were your precursor cell of RBC. Always remember in adult life all the blood cells that means red blood cell, white blood cell and platelet they are formed in bone marrow of some specific bones which include our skull bone, our sternum, ribs, vertebra and some bones uh, of our arm and leg. Okay, so those are the adult site of bone marrow formation and what happens in those bone marrow there are pluripotent hemopoietic stem cell which are responsible for making different types of blood cell and uh, after initiation those bone marrow stem cells those hemopoietic stem cells differentiate into more specialized cells some make RBC they are known as erythroblast some makes platelets they are known as megakaryocyte and so on and the precursor of RBC in the bone marrow is erythroblast and when these erythroblasts are normal, we call them normoblast. And when they are unusually enlarged, then we call them megaloblast. Okay? So I am repeating again what is megaloblast. Always remember, megaloblast is an unusually enlarged erythroblast. So whenever you say this definition to the examiner, you might be asked, then what is the difference between a megaloblast and a normoblast? Okay, so we will discuss that thing now. So the first difference I have already mentioned is the size, right? Megaloblast is larger than normoblast. Okay, one thing you have to remember, megaloblast is not a single cell, you know? Recall that we had different stages of normoblast when we were making red blood cell from the erythroblast. There was pro-normoblast, 
there was early normal blast, intermediate normal blast, late normal blast, reticulocyte, and so on. Similarly, when we're talking about megaloblast, there is not only one megaloblast, there is a series of megaloblasts, and we name them according to their counterpart in the normal blast. So they will include pro-megaloblast, then there will be um, pro megaloblast, then megaloblast, and so on. Okay, so always remember all those stages are larger than the normal blast. So that's the first difference between megaloblast and normal blast. Normal blast are smaller, actually normal blast are normal and megaloblast are larger than normal blast. The second difference between megaloblast and normal blast is difference in the nucleus okay so the nucleus of megaloblast is more open the chromatin network the chromatin network inside the megaloblast are more open and fine reticular in appearance so keep that in mind okay and always remember as the cells are maturing in the bone marrow, they become smaller and smaller and smaller and the nucleus inside those cells, uh, they, after a few stages, they clump. But since the megaloblast is a bit larger and uh, uh, there the nucleus clumps later. So the term in your textbook is there will be stippling nuclear stippling, some dotted appearance found inside the nucleus longer than the same stage of the normal blast. Okay, so I'm repeating again, what is a megaloblast? Megaloblast is an unusually enlarged normal blast. What is the difference between a megaloblast and a normal blast? The first point is of course the size. The second point is nucleus, the nucleus of megaloblast. The chromatin network of the nucleus is more open and fine and also the nuclear stippling persists for a longer period of time in case of megaloblast. The third point that we have to know about the difference between megaloblast and normal blast is the nuclear and cytoplasmic maturation. Okay, so always remember the nuclear maturation in case of megaloblast is lagging behind the cytoplasmic maturation. Okay, so what do we mean by cytoplasmic maturation in case of um, red blood cell synthesis? That means in the cytoplasm, we will say a cytoplasm is matured in case of RBC when there is a lot of hemoglobin. So when I'm saying in case of megaloblast, the cytoplasmic maturation is more than the nuclear maturation or in other words nuclear maturation is lagging behind the cytoplasmic maturation that means here we are having immature nucleus but at the same time the cytoplasm has been completely matured and having a lot of hemoglobin okay so keep that in mind okay so now that we have discussed the basic difference between megaloblast and normal blast and now we are ready for the second uh, topic and that was the type of megaloblastic anemia always remember megaloblastic anemia can be due to a variety of reason uh, but the commonest two types are vitamin b12 deficiency anemia and folate deficiency anemia okay so you may be asking a question now why are we getting megaloblast when there is deficiency of vitamin B12 or folate and this is a very high yield information this is very important and uh, so I have already drawn an image so that I can explain okay always remember inside our bone marrow as we are making more and more mature cells the size of those mature cells are decreasing. That means, say for example, if this was a stem cell and then this was a pro-normoblast, this was a 
normal blast, this is a reticulocyte, this is an RBC. So as we are making more and more mature lineage of cells, they decrease in size. That is an important characteristic of the cells of the bone marrow. Okay, so when we are having deficiency of vitamin B12 or deficiency of folate, we are having impaired DNA synthesis. And as we know, DNA synthesis is important for a cell to divide and to proceed with its maturation. So when we are having problem in DNA synthesis, the ultimate result will be impaired cell division and in other words, the cell will divide less. So for example, in this picture, if everything was normal, say we would have gotten up to this size. But since now we have vitamin B12 and folate deficiency, so we cannot divide uh, further. So the cell division may arrest here and look at the size of this cell compared to the size of this cell. This one is larger, you know. So that is the basis of finding larger cells in megaloblastic anemia. So now we will go deeper and I will try to explain how vitamin B12 and folate deficiency impairs DNA synthesis. Okay, so always remember tetrahydrofolate is important for DNA synthesis. After taking food containing folate, it converts into methyl tetrahydrofolate in the blood. Okay, but this methyl group is not good for DNA synthesis. So tetrahydrofolate will try to remove this methyl group. And how will he do that? He will give this methyl group to another substance, you know. So tetrahydrofolate initially will give this methyl group to vitamin B12 and then it will become from methyl tetrahydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate. Then that thing will be converted to another substance which is known as methylene tetrahydrofolate and this is very important. This will act as a coenzyme and this will be uh, needed for the reaction in which we will convert deoxyUMP into deoxyTMP. Deoxy uridine monophosphate will be converted to deoxythymidine monophosphate, you know. And this thymidine, we are making this thing by adding a methyl group. And this is an important pyrimidine, you know. So this reaction needs tetrahydrofolate. And then actually uh, that reaction continues, that thing becomes dihydrofolate, then becomes again tetrahydrofolate, and this circle continues. So that's one point. We are now um, understanding why we need folate. But why do we need vitamin B12 for DNA synthesis? Simple. If folate, methyl tetrahydrofolate, if that substance cannot transfer its methyl group into vitamin B12, this entire upper part of the biochemical reaction won't occur. And that means we won't have this pyrimidine and that means we will have impaired DNA synthesis which will result in impaired cell division and that will result in formation of larger cells which is known as megaloblast in case of the bone marrow. Okay, now always remember there is another interesting thing. Once vitamin B12 takes this methyl group from tetrahydrofolate, he doesn't keep it. He also tries to give that methyl group to someone else and vitamin B12 transfers that methyl group to homocysteine making methionine. Now this little reaction that I have drawn here will be important when we discuss about the neurological problems that vitamin B12 creates. Okay, So this is in short about the biochemistry of vitamin B12 and folate in case of DNA synthesis. So now that we have discussed the role of vitamin B12 and folate in DNA synthesis, so now 
we are ready to discuss vitamin B12 and folate metabolism. Okay, so in your textbook you will see a chart that is comparing the metabolism of vitamin B12 and folate and that chart is important for your MCQ. Okay, so I am writing the key points from that chart. So in one side I am writing vitamin B12 and on the other side folate. Okay, so first thing, first we have to know the source. So always remember the source of vitamin B12 is animal source. It is found in animal proteins, animal source for example in liver, kidney, heart, etc. Okay. Although small amount is found in some other substances, for example in um, certain sea food like shellfish, it's also found in cheese, milk in minute amount. Okay, and so the main source of vitamin B12 is animal source. The main source of folate is plant source. Folate is rich in green leafy vegetable. You know spinach, have you seen the cartoon Popeye, you know? Popeye takes spinach. My thinking is the spinach increases DNA synthesis, you know, because that's the job of folate. So remember about Popeye and remember about folate. The source of folate is in green leafy vegetables like in spinach and also in other leafy vegetables like cabbage and so on. Okay? The next thing, effect of cooking. Okay, so remember this is an important point. Whenever you're taking history of your patient, do take care to notice these things. The patient may tell you, doctor, I am eating sufficient amount of vegetable, but he or she may be cooking that vegetable and uh, sometimes, you know, overcooking. And always remember, cooking will result in loss of 60 to 90 percent of folate in those green liquid vegetables. And there will be about 10 to 30 percent loss of vitamin B12 uh, with cooking. So that's acceptable, but uh, you know, uh, it is better uh, to um, observe, you know, special care when we're cooking because, you know, overcooking may result in loss of 60 to even 90 percent of the vitamin folate in your spinach and cabbage. Okay? The third point about their metabolism is their daily requirement. Okay, so vitamins, vitamin B12 daily requirement is 2 to 4 microgram. And for folate, it's um, around 200 microgram. Okay, so this is the daily requirement. This is not the daily intake. This is the daily requirement that is needed. And in order to achieve that, surely we have to take more because, you know, there is a term called bioavailability. We don't get 100% of what we have eaten absorbed, you know, uh, if we have uh, taken the oral route. So, the daily intake for vitamin B12 is 5 to 30 microgram and for folate it's about 100 to 500 microgram. Okay, so always remember these are the basic um, concepts about vitamin B12 and folate metabolism and examiners always ask you an interesting question which will occur first say a patient is completely normal but uh, he is now taking less amount of folate and less amount of vitamin b12 so which deficiency will appear first always remember our body has a very big store of vitamin b12 inside us okay so even if we become strict vegans, you know, and we stop taking food from animal source. We still have at least two years of vitamin B12 store 
in our storage sites. Okay, but we can store folet only for about four months. That means if we stop taking folet containing food, our store will diminish in four months. Okay, so from this discussion you can see clearly that folate deficiency due to dietary deficiency will occur first. Okay, so now that we have talked about the basic concept of vitamin B12 and folate metabolism, now I would like to say a few words specially about the absorption of vitamin B12. Okay, because remember, vitamin B12 absorption is a very interesting and complicated procedure. Okay, so what happens, say we have taken some animal protein, it can be kidney, uh, liver, heart, so on, anything, even meat, selfish, cheese, milk. So those food contained, what it contained besides other things, vitamin B12. Okay, so what will happen? Vitamin B12 will bind with a protein which is known as R binder. You have to know this name, R binder, and they will make a complex. Okay, and remember, R binder is a protein that is made in the salivary gland. Okay, so from the salivary gland, that R binder is coming uh, to the stomach, and in the stomach, when the hydrochloric acid are uh, you know, breaking down the food particles into smaller parts and releasing vitamin B12 that R binder is binding with vitamin B12. Okay, and then this complex will go to the intestine. Okay, and what will happen in the intestine? Uh, we know pancreas also has a duct that opens in the intestine in the second part of the duodenum and through that opening pancreas can release a lot of proteolytic enzymes in the intestine and it does so and those proteolytic enzymes finally destroys these R binder vitamin B12 complex that is they uh, make these two things separate again and then what happens remember from the stomach In the gastric parietal cell, we had intrinsic factor, I am writing IF. So once the pancreatic enzymes separate vitamin B12 from the R binder, intrinsic factor which was released from the parietal cell of the stomach, they comes and joins the party and they make a complex of vitamin B12 and intrinsic factor. Why? Because remember, the site of absorption of vitamin B12 is in the ileum. Also, this is nice to know, the site of absorption of folate is duodenum and jejunum. And if you view some of my previous videos, you will know that the site of absorption of iron is also duodenum and jejunum. Okay, so that is uh, making uh, things easier both start with the word F folate and ferrous and they are absorbed from duodenum and jejunum but vitamin B12 is absorbed in the ileum and remember in the intestinal mucosal cells of the ileum on their surface they have receptor for intrinsic factor so unless vitamin b12 is bound to intrinsic factor those intestinal cells will not recognize vitamin b12 okay so that is very important and the reason i'm telling you all these things is when we will be discussing pernicious anemia okay i will say the word intrinsic factor repeatedly and you have to know where the intrinsic factor came and why it came okay so now that we have discussed the 
metabolism of vitamin B12. Now we are ready to discuss the clinical features. Okay, so one thing to know before we go to the clinical feature, what are the causes of vitamin B12 and folate deficiency? So the first cause I have already mentioned that is due to uh, insufficient um, nutrient, you know, dietary cause. But recall that if someone becomes strictly vegan, vitamin B12 deficiency will not occur instantaneously. It will take at least two years, sometimes five years or more, but folate deficiency can be apparent after four months. The second cause of vitamin B12 and folate deficiency that will lead to megaloblastic anemia is impaired absorption and as I have said in the entire process of absorption if there is problem anywhere we will have impaired absorption say for example if we have autoimmune destruction of the um, cells of the stomach you know then we won't have intrinsic factor produced and that will result in vitamin B12 deficiency and it, actually that is what happens in pernicious anemia so that is a cause of impaired absorption. There are some disease, say for example celiac disease or tropical sprue in which the villi of the intestine is lost and uh, that will also cause decreased absorption of vitamin B12 and folate. Okay, And there are some other causes of vitamin B12 and folate deficiency. Say for example fish tapeworm. Regarding the causes of folate deficiency that can also occur due to inadequate intake. Also it can occur due to impaired absorption which includes as I said before celiac disease, tropical sprue. But one thing you have to remember uh, in case of folate deficiency we will add one more cause and that is increased demand. And when does demand for folate increases. It increases say for example in pregnancy when we need to make more cells for the fetus you know uh, the demand for folate increases in hemolytic anemia you know hemolytic anemia that's another topic but in short there we are having hemolysis very rapidly normal red blood cell dies after 120 days and then it broken down that is known as hemolysis but in hemolytic anemia the RBC lifespan is severely reduced sometimes as as low as two to three days and since the RBC are uh, destroying very rapidly so the bone marrow which is the factory where red blood cells are produced the bone marrow has to over work you know and it has to do more and more cell division and that will uh, require folate okay so uh, increased demand for folate in pregnancy in hemolytic anemia and some other condition of the bone marrow say for example myeloproliferative disorder which is a proliferative disorder of the bone marrow and it has several stages also in case of leukemia you know in leukemia uh, that is a disorder a cancer of the white blood cell uh, the cells are dividing rapidly and that's increasing the demand for folate and also in different types of lymphoma and carcinoma the demand for folate will increase okay so that is the um, common causes of vitamin b12 and folate deficiency so now Let's go back to the main topic, megaloblastic anemia. We discussed vitamin B12 and folate metabolism and their uh, causes of deficiency because vitamin B12 and folate deficiency results in megaloblastic anemia. So what will be the clinical feature? Okay, so we will start first with megaloblastic anemia that is occurring due to vitamin B12 deficiency. The patient will uh, have complaints of anemia, the patient will have complaint in his or her tongue, there will be inflammation of the tongue which is known as glossitis and there will be some neurological manifestation, they include peripheral neuropathy and subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord. Okay. So, 
I am writing those clinical features. And remember, you will be asked these things in your exam. Nowadays, exams are not straightforward. They will not say, uh, write down the lab diagnosis of megaloblastic anemia. No, they will try to make you confused, you know. They will say, a man of 25 years, strictly vegan. Remember, strictly vegan, strictly vegan. That means he is not taking food from animal source. So he's, he or she may have deficiency of vitamin B12. So the question may be like this. A man of 25 years, strictly vegan, came to you with the complaints of anemia. Then there was glossitis, inflammation of the tongue. Okay and there was peripheral neuropathy and there was subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord okay so what will be your diagnosis the patient is having megaloblastic anemia due to vitamin b12 deficiency okay so now, the interesting part, remember I told you earlier that this little part of this reaction has importance. Remember, when we are having vitamin B12 deficiency, what was the role of vitamin B12? It took the methyl group from tetrahydrofolate and so that the tetrahydrofolate can continue in its pathway to make thymine. Okay. But at the same time, vitamin B12 doesn't like this methyl group and it wants to pass that group to homocysteine and make methionine. But now, since we have no vitamin B12, homocysteine cannot be converted to methionine. So that will result in increase of homocysteine. And remember, in biochemistry, when one pathway is not working or one pathway is stopped sometimes the substrate of those pathways are used more in some other pathway so homocysteine will be used in more amount in another pathway and they will make some metabolites which are toxic for your nerve you know and that will result in the peripheral neuropathy and subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord okay now do you understand this thing combined degeneration what does that mean well in the spinal cord if you recall the anatomy of the spinal cord you know there were lots of tracts ascending tracts descending tracts you know ascending tracts they are located uh, usually dorsally they are carrying sensory information and there was a lot of descending tract you know so there was sensory and motor pathway and whenever we say the word combined degeneration of the spinal cord we mean both sensory and motor pathways are involved okay so that is important so now that we have discussed the clinical features of vitamin b12 deficiency what will be the clinical feature of megaloblastic anemia due to folate deficiency? Well, uh, anemia will be present, glossitis will be present. Okay, but these two things, these neurological manifestations, they won't be present. Okay, so now that we have discussed the main clinical features, now we will uh, discuss how can we diagnose a megaloblastic anemia. Okay. The commonest way to diagnose is to do an assay of vitamin B12 or folate. Okay, so we can measure vitamin B12 or folate in a person. And uh, that can give us indication of if he or she has vitamin B12 or folate deficiency. Okay, so one thing you have to know, the first test is vitamin B12 assay for vitamin B12 and folate assay for folate. Now, there is a special test which is known as Schilling test and you have to know that test okay so we perform this test to determine 
if a person's megaloblastic anemia is due to inadequate vitamin B12 intake or due to problem in the absorption of vitamin B12 okay so both are will cause vitamin B12 deficiency but mechanism is slightly different if a patient had vitamin B12 deficiency anemia due to inadequate intake if we just correct his intake he will uh, recover but if that same patient had problem with the absorption of vitamin b12 then we have to treat the underlying cause first you know so that's why we do a test which is known as the shilling test how do we do this we ask the patient to have um, come to the clinic uh, fasting then initially we will give that patient oral dose of this is important radioactive don't get scared you know we are not giving him high radiation he won't transform into you know an incredible hulk or spider-man we're just giving him minute amount of so don't get scared okay so we are giving him oral radioactive vitamin b12 the reason we are giving him radioactive vitamin b12 is so that we can tag that vitamin b12 and follow you know so we're giving him one microgram oral radioactive vitamin b12 okay so he is taking this oral formulation then we will wait two hours so we are waiting two hours and then what we will do now is the interesting part we will try to flush that patient with vitamin b12 now we will give him IV intravenous 1000 look initially we gave only one microgram but now we're giving 1000 microgram but the good news is this thing is not radioactive no we are not giving 1000 microgram radioactive vitamin B12 in a person we're giving 1000 microgram normal or non radioactive or non radioactively labeled vitamin B12 to the same person intravenously okay then what will we do this high dose of vitamin B12 will flush along with other vitamin B12s one third of the radioactive oral vitamin B12 and we can measure those radioactive vitamin B12 in 24 hours urine sample okay so I am repeating again shilling test is very important for your exam this is a test we perform to determine the cause of vitamin B12 deficiency either due to inadequate intake or inadequate absorption the procedure is we ask the patient to come after fasting then we give him one microgram oral radioactively labeled vitamin B12 and wait for two hours. After two hours, we give the patient 1000 microgram intravenous non radioactive vitamin B12. And then we measure the amount of radioactive vitamin B12 in 24 hours urine sample. Now remember, normal is 10%. If the result is 10% if we see 10% vitamin B12 uh, in the urine sample of a patient then we can say that uh, that patient's absorptive capability for vitamin B12 is all right then surely if that patient has vitamin B12 deficiency that is maybe probably due to inadequate dietary intake okay but if that thing is less than 10% then we have to suspect there is some problem in absorption of vitamin B12 okay so that's an important thing you have to keep in in your mind okay so lab diagnosis what will we do we will try to assess vitamin b12 and folate level for those we have different types of assay vitamin b12 assay folate assay and there is also a special test for vitamin b12 that is the shilling test and now since this is a hematology topic so you may be wanting to know what will we see in the blood what will we see in the 
bone marrow. So now let's go to those things, although these are mainly for your uh, conception. We can diagnose vitamin B12 deficiency with those assays. Okay, so what will we see in the peripheral blood picture? So surely hemoglobin level will decrease. Okay, so here is an interesting question. Why does the megaloblast cause anemia? You know, we are saying megaloblast occurs due to vitamin B12 and folate deficiency due to DNA synthesis problem. Okay, so why is that thing causing anemia? The reason for anemia in megaloblastic uh, disease is those megaloblasts in the bone marrow fail to compensate for the hemolysis that is occurring in the um, blood. So that is one thing. So there will be anemia. Then we are going to the red cell indices. The main thing here is mean corpuscular volume will increase. Normal level for that is 80 to 100 femtoliter. Here that thing will be more than 100. Okay, so more than 100 femtoliter. Okay. Uh, then we are going to the peripheral blood film, PBF. What will we see here? We will see something called macrocyte. Oval macrocyte. Okay, so I have drawn an oval shaped macrocyte. Look at this image. This is a normal red blood cell. Two third is red and there is one third pale. That is the central paler biconcave circular disc of RBC viewed from the top and this is a you can see an oval uh, macrocyte this is a finding that we see in the peripheral blood of a patient with uh, megaloblastic anemia also what will we see we will see something like this what is this this is known as hyper segmented neutrophil okay so this is a very important point, hypersegmented neutrophil. Normally neutrophil contains 3 to 5 lobes. This is normal. Okay. Whenever a neutrophil has um, 6 lobes, that is called, that is more than 5 lobes, that is called hypersegmented neutrophil. But also remember there is a criteria in your textbook. And the criteria is, although we are saying that 5 lobe containing neutrophil is normal, but if neutrophil which contains 5 lobe, their percentage in the blood is more than 5%, I'm writing here, 5 lobed neutrophil, more than 5% or if one 6 lobed neutrophil in one field, one microscope visual field, if even if you can see one neutrophil that has 6 lobe, we will say that is a hypersegmented blood picture, hypersegmented neutrophil containing blood picture, blood film. Or if five lobed neutrophil uh, percentage, their percentage is more than five percent, that will be also called hypersegmented neutrophil. Okay, uh, so these are the main findings that we will see in the peripheral blood. Okay, so this is you can see this is a hypersegmented neutrophil. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lobes here. Okay, recall that the colors are not perfectly accurate you know so you know I don't have a purple marker so I drew that thing with blue but actually this nucleus will be purple in color okay so this has to be purple not blue okay. and these granules are pink so this is the finding that we will have in the peripheral blood film what will we have in the bone marrow of a patient with megaloblastic anemia? We will have megaloblastic erythropoiesis and we have already discussed about megaloblast. What will we see in granulopoiesis? We can see some giant cells uh, in the bone marrow. They are known as giant 
uh, stab cells they are found but however those cells are not responsible for the hyper segmented neutrophil uh, they actually die in the bone marrow those cells okay and uh, these are the main findings we will see in the bone marrow okay so the last thing that we have to discuss is the treatment okay so how will we treat uh, megaloblastic anemia uh, like I said with the treatment of iron deficiency anemia the treatment always has two stages first we have to treat the underlying cause and then we have to increase the level of uh, vitamin B12 in their body okay so how can we do that uh, to increase vitamin level in the patient's body we will have to give them vitamin B12 supplement so to give supplement uh, for vitamin B12 deficiency we have to take the um, deep subcutaneous or intramuscular pathway and the there are a lot of uh, ways we can uh, increase the vitamin B12 level in our body one way is to give 1000 microgram vitamin B12 deep subcutaneously or intramuscularly daily for one week so we are giving this daily up to one week um, that is the initial dose and then we will give maintenance dose that is 1000 microgram once in every three months for whole life okay so first we give 1000 microgram vitamin b12 deep subcutaneous or im daily for one week that is the initial dose or the loading dose and then we will continue the maintenance dose of giving 1000 microgram vitamin b12 once in every three months for life okay so before concluding i would like to add one more thing the topic we discussed can be also given uh, you know uh, the name macrocytic anemia since we get macrocyte found in the peripheral blood film so macrocytic anemia is anemia in which mcv mean corpuscular volume is more than 100 you know but remember there are some macrocytic anemia in which we won't see megaloblastic anemia or megaloblast in the bone marrow those are known as macrocytic anemia without megaloblast or macrocytic anemia with normal blast you know and there are some examples of those in your textbook mainly hemolytic anemia also those are found in some liver disease uh, in some alcohol problem in some leukemia and so on so always keep that thing in your mind too okay so megaloblastic anemia is a very long topic you know the last thing i would like to discuss about this topic is pernicious anemia uh, it occurs due to autoimmune destruction of the um, gastric cells the cells of the stomach you know and recall that those cells the parietal cells they made intrinsic factor so since those are now destroyed so there is no intrinsic factor and so there is inadequate absorption of vitamin b12 and that will lead to the manifestation of vitamin b12 and all its clinical features okay so this is in short about vitamin b12 deficiency and folate deficiency anemia and this is in short about the main topic that was megaloblastic anemia okay so i hope you go through your textbooks and study more thoroughly about this megaloblastic anemia chapter because this is a big chapter very big to cover in a single lecture but uh, i hope this was helpful okay so that's all for today take care thank you